So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our 11th annual w Wings Club Lunch Aviation Leader Series Luncheon in Dublin. We have a record crowd here today with almost 350 people in attendance, and we thank you all for being here. I'm James Myler, the chairman of the Wings Club Foundation European chapter and deputy CEO of the Arts Aviation Group. I'd like to start by welcoming our featured speaker, Mr. Donald Slattery, Chief Executive Officer of Avalon, seated here at the head table, and we'll be formally introducing Donald later in the program. Just now, I'd also like to begin introducing you to the head table. Joining us today also are David Siegel, Chief Executive Officer of AWOS, Kieran Kaur, the CEO of Standard Chartered Bank, Marlon Daly, Chief Commercial Officer of AWOS and Wings Club Board Member, Tom Fitzsimon, who's the Executive Director of the Wings Club in New York, John Slattery, President and CEO of Embraer Commercial Airplanes and former Wings Club President in New York, John Higgins, Chief Commercial Officer and President of Avalon, Mary Louise Kelly, Chief Financial Officer of RX Aviation, Graeme Lees, the Head of Trading for Bank of China Aviation. So I think most of you have been to you know, a lunch here in Dublin before, but the Wings Club is definitely better known you know, in, New, in New York circles, we think. But as the aviation market's growing and growing more in here, here in Dublin, we're really looking to kind of increase the presence and the, the opportunities that come with being part of the Wings Club. And the Wings Club mission is to foster opportunities to pursue an education in the field of aviation. It's to provide programs to educate in the field of aviation and to support charitable organizations that use aviation to help those in need. And the Wings Club itself is a charitable organization. And that's, I think, very important that everyone remembers that at these events, money raised at the lunches go to scholarships, go to various aviation-linked charities. So not only do you get a great chance to network with you know, your clients, customers, and friends, but also you're supporting a great, great cause with a specific focus on aviation. One of the, the Wings Club is always keen to support new initiatives and development, and I'm sure many of you have heard about and supported the Propel Her initiative. Propel Her is a, a new industry initiative whose objective is to inspire, motivate, and enable women to advance their careers in aircraft leasing. It aims to create a forum for discussions of topical issues and networking with peers and opportunities to learn and develop within the aviation leasing market. It's done so through informal quarterly events and to date successful events have been hosted by AWOS and Airbus Financial Services. Propel Her is comprised of women from all across the Irish leasing community with 25 companies currently represented. And talking about it here today because AWOS have generously sponsored the Propel Her table and um, we have representatives here from FPG Amentum, Ergo, AWOS, Bank of China Aviation, CIT, MCAP, Standard Chartered among others and we'd like to welcome the, the Propel Her table. <laughs> Donald Slattery, our guest speaker. Donald has 28 years experience in the aircraft leasing industry. At the age of 27, he founded the aircraft and investment banking company, International Aviation Management Group, IAMG. He later went on to serve as chief executive of RBS Aviation Capital, and in 2010, Donald co-founded Avalon. After five years of private ownership, Avalon was listed on the New York Stock Exchange in what was the largest ever listing on the exchange by an Irish founded company. Avalon has now been built into one of the top three less aircraft lessors in the world. Donald has personally received numerous awards and recognition. Most recently, in December, received the award for outstanding contribution to the aviation industry at the Aviation Industry Awards. So great pleasure. I welcome Donald to come up on stage and uh, give us some of his insights and experiences. And very much look forward to that. Donald. Uh, James Myler um, was trained by Tony Ryan, and um, I'm glad he described IAMG. Where's Barry Flannery? Where's Barry Flannery? Yep, Barry Flannery is down there. Barry, he described IMG as an investment banking business. Do you remember we used to describe it as that? Because investment banking business is traded at an eight times multiple. We were lucky to get one. Um, but James said it's a, an honor, uh, and thank you very much for the uh, kind invitation to speak at the Wings Club. 
uh, as, I, as I look around the room and, and earlier before coming in and indeed at the table, um, as always in our business, um, you, you, you think about the memories and you think about the friendships that are, are developed uh, in this wonderful uh, industry, the, the aviation industry and the kerosene that flows through, through all our veins. And whilst we are competing against each other, whether we're lessors or we're buying from the manufacturers or we're playing manufacturers off against each other or banks or lawyers, at the end of the day, as Tony Ryan used to say to me um, when I was polishing his shoes, we'll always have a good dinner. And I'd like to thank the, the I was going to say the Four Seasons, but the, the Intercontinental Hotel um, for a wonderful lunch. And uh, it's great. And it's quite extraordinary to see um, 350 people in the room uh, today and to, to help raise the, the, the money for the, um, the Wings Club Foundation. Um, and I, I do have a kind of a special link with the Wings Club because when we started IAMG uh, in 1994, and John was there, John Slattery, uh, almost from the beginning, um, we had a partner at the time called Bill Alderman. And Bill was a, a member, we were all very young, we were in our 20s. We were kind of making it up as we went along. And Bill said, we have to be in the Wings Club. It's very important. They have a very, very important dinner in the Waldorf Astoria every year. And the tables were, whatever they were at the time, $2,000. It might as well have been $2 million. So we begged and borrowed and stealed, and we got on a Boeing table, we got on an Airbus table, we got on a Fokker table, for those of you that remember Fokker. Um, and that was our first night, I think in 1994, 1995, that I got to see the Wings Club in, in action. And when I think about my, my own career in the industry, and moments and moments of truth, I have to be honest and say one of the proudest moments of, of my career in the industry was nothing to do with me at all. It was in 2007, 10 years ago, where the youngest president of the Wings Club hosted the dinner, the first non-American, and he was my brother. And so that was an extremely proud moment and maybe we recognize John Slattery. Um, <laughs> But there's, there's two sides to every story because we just found out over lunch that the honoree at that dinner, and for those of you that have been in the industry for a while, will remember the famous Maurizio Patelio, who was the visionary of, of Embraer in the 80s and, and indeed in the 90s, and a driving force behind Embraer. And it appears that John, back in 2007, had already decided he wanted to be working with Embraer because they made Maurizio the Lifetime Achievement Award and as John was introducing him on stage, he passed him the old resume. <laughs> a deal is a deal, Marlon. You know, capitalism, when we think about it, um, um, is what kind of rules us on a daily basis. And um, the following might, might, might bring a smile to your face. I saw this recently, and I just thought it'd be worth uh, sharing it with you. Um, and, you know, as the world is changing and evolving. And, you know, traditional capitalism might be described in uh, agricultural terms as you have two cows, you start off with two cows, you sell one and you buy a bull. If you're lucky, the herd multiplies, the economy grows, and eventually you sell your herd of cows and you retire. That's capitalism, Irish style. But if you go to America, they have a slightly different take on it, and uh, with respect to Dave Siegel and Marlon who are at the table, and Tom, the American thesis on capitalism is a little different. You do start off with two cows, but you sell three of them to your publicly listed company using letters of credit, which are opened by your brother at the bank. Then you do a debt equity swap with an associated general offer so that you get all four cows back with a tax exemption for five cows. <laughs> now, the milk rights of the six cows are transferred via an intermediary to a Cayman Island company, secretly owned by the majority shareholder, who sells the rights to all seven cows back to your listed company. And finally, the public company buys your bull in a spin-off. Do we have any French people in the room? We must have um, 
representatives from Airbus in the room. Well, in France, as in America and Ireland, you start off with two cows, but you go on strike because you want three cows. <laughs> Several of us started our first business in the Cayman Islands, and we may have law firms from the Cayman Islands in the room. But in the Cayman Islands, you start off with 5,000 cows. None of them belong to you. But you charge them servicing fees. And then finally, in deference and respect to our Chinese shareholder, also you start with two cows, but you re-engineer them so they can live for 100 years, they eat once a month, and they milk themselves. And preferably, you can leverage them. Yesterday was a milestone uh, for our firm, and um, it was uh, an extraordinary uh, experience for us. And all I want to say with respect to that is I want to thank uh, a number of people who helped make that happen. First and foremost, I would like to thank our new colleagues, uh, who I know are in the room, um, that became part of the Avalon uh, tribe yesterday. And so wherever you are in the room, you are genuinely welcome to the Avalon tribe and we're delighted. There were a number of advisors, investment banking advisors. Um, I don't know if UBS or Morgan Stanley are in the room, but they're off busily spending the 150 million in fees that we gave them. Um, but without them, it couldn't have happened and indeed all the banks who supported us on the capital markets. Um, on the legal side, we had Wal Gotcho, we had Clifford Chance, uh, we had Maples working with us, uh, KPMG on the tax side, uh, helping us figure it all out, and ENY. All of these, the vast majority of them, have very significant presence here in Ireland, and were part of, of this transaction, which was, um, you know, a 10.4 billion dollar deal. So, my uh, t position today is really just to thank you because it took a year to make that happen. It closed yesterday. When James and I were working on this lunch, I said, James, April 5. Um, but we were lucky. We hadn't planned it that way. Um, when James asked me to, to, to speak at lunch, he said, can you keep it to about 50 to 60 minutes? <laughs> Marlon, Marlon Dady said, no, we'll cut, that, we'll cut that down to 47 minutes, uh, similar to the dispatch reliability of the 737-800. One of Marlon Daly's favorite airplanes. Ladies and gentlemen, Marlon Daly, the Boeing Company, and AWOS. Um, James said it be, might be interesting to just to share you know, some of your experiences along the way. And, and what I didn't want to do was do the Donald Slattery show. And for those of you that know me, I'm very prone to that. Um, and I was thinking back over the last 28 years, and it's frightening to me that it is that. And it started at GPA, 1989. Um, it, it then moved on to IAMG, it then went on to the business that we started at RBS, and it then moved on to Avalon. So four iterations, if you like. And if I, if I think through that 28 years, um, and I think about the lessons learned, and the sort of core issue I might take away from that, you know, strategy, yeah, super important, that's great. You need to get it right. Vision, really important. You need to be able to communicate it repeatedly. Um, timing, really important. But actually, when you cut to the chase on it, the number one thing that I've learned is that your culture and the values of your organization are the difference between success and failure. And if you can get your values right, and the culture clearly defined and live it every day from the top to the bottom of that organization, you're 80% of the way to success in any business you run, whether it's a global aircraft leasing business or the local pizza shop in the corner. And values are absolutely central to the way we think about Avalon. We have a value set that we call TRIBE. And it's an acronym for transparency, respect, insightfulness, bravery, and ebullience. And ebullience is a fancy word for the crack. And we think that's really important that 
all of us, we should take what we do very seriously in our, in our professional lives and be the best we can be at it. But genuinely, at the end of the day, try desperately hard not to take yourself too seriously. Because if you can apply yourself in that way, people will be endeared to you. You'll be self-effacing towards yourself. You'll take the mick out of yourself. You'll be hugely professional. And we found at Avalon that that's part of our secret sauce. And when we talk to our colleagues and we ask them which of these values stands, you know, which means most to them, and there are two, two that they pick out. First is transparency, you know, knowing what's going on and feeling part of the essence of the story. But the second one, the one that actually gets picked most, is bravery. And as we think about our industry and we think about the essence of it and the ethos of it, bravery defines the aviation industry. You know, if we go all the way back to the early part of the 1900s, the bravery involved in becoming an aviator, becoming a pioneer in aviator, was extraordinary. And in this country, in 1929, we had a gentleman called James Fitzmaurice. He was a captain in the Irish Air Corps, the young, nascent Irish Air Corps at the time. And he piloted the first aircraft east-west in 1929, against the winds, with no radio, no navigation tools, and three of them on the airplane. And I think about the bravery that must have existed in his head and in his colleague's head at that time, because it was binary. They were either going to make it, or they were dead. There was no option, no alternative. There was no pickup, no rescue. And some people might say, well, that was just crazy. And other people might, might say, wow, that was an amazing, adventurous, pioneering spirit. It, it really doesn't matter. What, what, what's important is that as we build our businesses in Ireland, that we keep bravery to the fore. Because if we go back to 1975, in Shannon, Tony Ryan, you know, he was a pretty brave guy, six or seven of them saying, we're actually going to build this aircraft leasing business or industry. They had no idea what the aircraft leasing industry would turn out to be. Um, but it was brave. And as we sit here today in 2017, I think we all know the stats of what the industry is like. And as I was thinking about the makeup of the top three players in the industry today, we have Gus Kelly's business at Aircap, Alex, Alec Berger's at GCAS, and our business at Avalon. They're the top three players in this industry today. All three of them, without a doubt, trace their roots to Shannon and to Ireland in one way or another. And I think that's an extraordinary um, legacy for the, for the country to have, and one that I am certainly very proud of, and I know that our, my colleagues in Avalon are very proud of. And I was struck by James talking earlier in his opening remarks about the ISTAT, excuse me, about the Wings Foundation, excuse me, Freudian slip. Um, and foundations are, are really, really important because they play a critical role in giving back. And it did, did strike me as I was preparing my, my remarks over the last couple of days that maybe the time has come now, given the scale of our industry here in Ireland, and given the quantum of profits that we make, that maybe it's time for us as an aircraft leasing industry in Ireland to establish our own foundation. A foundation that each lessor that's based in Ireland, doesn't have to be exclusive, would actually contribute a fixed amount every year. And I was sort of doing the sort of back of the cigarette packet as to what that number could look like. And I was thinking to myself, okay, let's assume there's 4,000 airplanes leased from Ireland. I don't know whether that's the correct number. It's plus or minus, it's in that zone. And if each of us agreed to contribute $100 per month per aircraft we had in our portfolio every year, that would be about $5 million per annum to go to a central foundation. And over five years, that would be a $25 million contribution. And my thought process here is, oh, we're, is more about 
think about this as an idea. This is not like, oh, this is Donald Slattery's and we're going to make it happen. But it just seems to me there's a real opportunity, a higher purpose, if you like, to take the, the DNA lottery that we find ourselves. We've been extremely lucky. We work in a fabulous industry. It's really interesting and we get paid well to do it. But I actually think as, as we move on, and I was 50 this year and, and kind of, it did strike me that a legacy is now really important. And I think it would be really cool if the Irish aircraft leasing industry established its own foundation, properly run, with good, excellent governance, and we all agreed to contribute pro rata. So the big guys would give more, the smaller guys would give less, 100 bucks a month. So have a think about it, and maybe if people are interested, we could get a little work group going on this. And you know, a couple of years ago, a number of us came together to fund the um, master's program at UCD. It's the first dedicated program in the world uh, for aviation finance and law. And it seems to me we can be doing many of them all over the world. And that's the type of work that the foundation could do. So have a think about it. If you're interested, reach out to me because I think it's actually something that's worthwhile. All of us do great stuff on the ground. Each company has its own agenda, its own corporate social responsibility agenda. We have our, our own at Avalon, it's called CARE. Everybody does their own good work. But actually, if we could bring it all together in some structured way and really make a difference, I think it'd be pretty cool. So looking, looking forward, um, you know, what are we thinking about at Avalon? What do we think is happening in our industry or indeed in the world? And I, mean, I have just four things maybe to share with you. Um, and uh, you know, it's wrapped in a kind of a continuum of constant change. The industry is changing at a pace that's unprecedented, whether it's the design of airplanes, the number of new participants in the industry, the number of new players. You know, 10, 15 years ago, we'd have been lucky to have 100 people in this room. Now we have 350. In two or three years' time, it could be five or 600. Absolutely. But as we think about our industry, um, my, my gut is telling me that we're into a phase of this industry now, which is about 40 years old, that the returns that we make, our profitability, our ROE, IRR, whichever metric you care to use, are probably going to compress. My, my gut is that the, the good times are over in terms of really strong ROEs. And I think the ROE expectations of some of the new investors, the majority of whom are coming from Asia, where I spent the last 15 months, are lower. And so when we look out into, say, the sale and leaseback market today at Avalon, we're finding it really difficult to uh, understand the, uh, the rationale of some of the pricing that's in the market. And you know, when John and I and Tom and Andy and others sit down, we're going, you know, is this a cyclical thing or is it a structural thing? My gut is it's, it's a structural. I think the returns have shifted downwards. And there's a school of thought which says that's probably not a bad thing because it means institutional investors, equity or debt, deem this industry to be lower risk. So that's the first thing I think we're into. A, a period for the foreseeable where lower ROE is going to be the norm of the day. The second is unquestionably choppy waters. I've been through four cycles, and it is a cyclical business. And as we've said many times, if you don't believe that, um, you're, you're probably being naive. So as we, as we look out, um, all of us are seeing interest rates moving up. We're seeing oil kind of, you know, starting to get a bit bullish again. It's off a little bit in the last month or so. We're seeing the dollar getting strong, which is not good for our airlines in the emerging markets. We're seeing OEM production rates, particularly in the wide body space, at levels that are, in my opinion, unsustainable. Uh, we're seeing you know, orders into certain parts of the world, uh, orders that have been made in the last five to seven years that don't feel like the right metric right now, particularly in the Middle East, where there's enormous wide body supply going in there. Uh, over the next number of years. It just doesn't feel right to, to us. Um, we have the Trump factor and the protectionism that travels with that. You know, doesn't feel great. And, you know, yesterday that lunatic in North Korea launched another missile into the um, Japanese sea. And he's, you know, who knows whether you take that seriously or not, but it just all feels, when you put it all into the mixer, and you're thinking about the next number of years as you're planning, feels choppy. So, you know, my gut is cautious steps ahead over the next um, couple of years. Third thing, um, 
is we believe, certainly I believe, that consolidation is likely to continue, or will continue. Um, Avalon has been part of, part of that. Avalon into Hong Kong Aviation Capital, now into CIT. Um, obviously, we had the AirCap ILFC transaction a number of years ago. Um, I honestly believe that's going to continue. And our feeling, and you know, we'll only know in time, but my, my personal view is that by 2020, not too long ago, or not too long more, three or four years from now, three of the top five lessors in the world will be, will be owned by Chinese players. Okay? Um, and we could, couldn't have imagined that as a scenario a, a decade ago. Now, time will tell whether that ever comes to four, but you know, Avalon has its role as number three. We'll see where the world takes us in terms of future opportunities. But I really believe, based on being in that market, having lived in Hong Kong for the last 15 months, meeting and talking to a lot of the new players, that their ambitions are boundaryless, and their supply of capital is, ex is, is deep, and their ROE expectations are low. But it's not all bad, because I think when you, s then my job really is to source that, that aircraft, structure the lease well, sell it to that investor, manage it for them, uh, and they're happy at a 5% ROE. And I think that is going to become a core growth strategy for a lot of the top 10 players in the industry today. We've all been doing it over the years, trading aircraft, selling airplanes, um, you know, to, to generate P&L, manage risk. But actually, if you look at the top 10 players, there's really only one that you could say is a classic asset manager in scale, and, that, and that's Babcock and Brown. So my feeling, again, is that over the course of the next five years, we're probably going to see the rise of new institutional investors, predominantly Asian players, who actually want exposure to the asset class, because they think it's a good investment, and it is, but they don't want to be a lessor. They don't want to take the operational risk of a lessor. And so the opportunity for all of us in the room is to source those investors, um, give them a supply of good quality airplanes at reasonable terms and conditions, manage the assets well, and they'll come back and want to do more business with you. As we look into China, which is our home market now, um, we've identified maybe five very large institutions that a year ago I wouldn't have even known the brand name. You know, these are investors with $500 billion of assets that literally we've never heard of in the West. And they're growing every day because there are 1.4 billion people in that country contributing to life insurance policies, pension funds, et cetera, the likes of which, the scale of which is just unimaginable. And as we think about the demographics over the next decade, a billion people will move up into the, into the global middle class. And that's all good news for the people in this room because we're all going to need more airplanes the leasing industry is going to continue to grow, albeit at lower returns in my opinion, but we will make our money in different ways because we'll be smart, we'll be nimble, and if we go back to um, one of those values, we're gonna be brave and take risk. And risk taking is inherent in the Irish, um, and it's something we should be very proud of. Uh, we've had to take risk in the past, whether it's the last decade or over the last 100 years, to survive and thrive. And I'm deeply proud of, of my colleagues at Avalon, John Higgins, who's here today, and Kai Shang Mo from H&A, and all of my new colleagues from uh, CIT are now part of Avalon Tribe. This is a fantastic thing. And I'm genuinely honored and thrilled, James, to have been asked to speak to you today. I uh, hope you've enjoyed my few words. Enjoy the rest of your lunch, and thank you very much.